Thank you so much, Dean Lee and President Lee. It is an honor for us to have the tech support of the REA's president, no less, right? Um, I am uh, honored to be the moderator, AKA timekeeper for this session in the evening, Chicago Central Time, but morning uh, where um, our presenters are. Um, a quick note about the flow of our session or 90 minutes together, we will um, do a quick uh, introduction of our presenters, and then um, they will have between 20 to 25 minutes to share their ideas. We assume that you've read the papers that have been posted on the website, so we want to leave time for ample engagement at the end, right? We'll do a quick thinking break after they're done presenting their ideas, and then I'll open it up for Q&A in different forms for us, right? Um, and we'll leave time for them to wrap up and say concluding words at the end. All right, without further ado, let me introduce our three speakers consecutively before turning it over to them. Our first speaker um, presenter is Dr. Tapita Kartika, my apologies, Christiani, Professor of Christian Education at the Faculty of Theology, Duta Wachana Christian University in Jakarta, Indonesia. She graduated from Boston College for her doctoral degree in 2005. She is an ordained minister of the Indonesia Christian Church and is active in interfaith dialogue in Indonesia, disability advocacy, both in Indonesia and the Ecumenical Disability Advocates Network of the World Council of Churches. She's got publications, which I'll drop in the chat box if you are interested in looking up. Her last uh, latest uh, is, an, um, is a contribution to the Bloomsbury Handbook of Religious Education in the Global South entitled Indonesian Students' Perceptions on Doctrines, Ethics, and Identity in Religious Education. Our second speakers together uh, share a presentation, uh, but the one speaking on behalf of the pair will be Dr. Ravi Chandra. Uh, he is Associate Professor at Japanese Theological Seminary in Indonesia. And before that, he spent 10 years as a lecturer in, oh my, good, oh my goodness, Prasatia Malia Business School, Jakarta. Um, his research are in the areas of indigenous religion, spirituality, interfaith education, metaphors, and nonprofit organizational leadership. He's written more than 50 books in Indonesian and English. That's a little bit greedy, right? Um, and his partner in thought is Dr. Julia Saliman. Um, she has been teaching research methodology, statistics, test construction, psychology of learning at the Faculty of Psychology in the universe, in Universitas Indonesia since 1980. She has uh, also been involved in Christian education curriculum planning and writing at the national level since 1989, both with the Indonesian Church's Communion and the Indonesian Ministry of Education and Culture. Her research interests are on higher order thinking, emotional and spiritual development. Best times uh, for her uh, come when supervising students of diverse faith and uh, doing research together on tolerance and empathy, right? Uh, with that, let me invite Dr. Christiani to begin her presentation. Thank you, my aunt. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. I would like to share screen to help us in our discussion. So the title is Inclusive Christian Religious Education in Schools in Indonesia. And I would like to start with the definition of inclusive education according to the UNICEF. An education system that includes all students and welcomes and supports them to learn whoever they are and whatever their abilities or requirements. This means making sure that teaching and the curriculum, school buildings, classrooms, play areas, transport and toilets are appropriate for all children at all levels. Inclusive education means all children learn together in the same schools. 
that is the definition and i uh, i use this definition to to focus uh, my paper and then uh, the focus goal and the methodology of my paper this paper focuses on christian religious education or cre in inclusive schools and a general school that has a student with disability using qualitative method namely observation and interview this study aims to describe and analyze the practice of cre in inclusive schools the impact of cre in improving the involvement of students with disabilities in communities and the development of interdisciplinary CRE in inclusive schools. Context and background about uh, Indonesia. In Indonesia, there are two kinds of schools for children with disabilities. The first one is special schools. It's older. It's, it has been more than more than a century, I think, or uh, several decades at least. And then uh, the inclusive schools just started this century, I mean 2009 uh, and until now. And then about the regulation of the Indonesian uh, inclusive education, we can uh, see on the, the Indonesian Minister of National Education Regulation that I will not read. Uh, and also, I combine with religious education in schools that is a compulsory subject, and there is also another regulation in Indonesia. So uh, that is the background of, of my paper about Indonesia. And then the theoretical frameworks that I use uh, Christian religious education as an interdisciplinary subject. I think we all agree with this. Education is recognized as a field requiring interdisciplinary collaboration. It is public, it is diverse, it is dependent on a living religion uh, for vitality. That is what Sarah Little uh, says and cited by Jack Seymour in his book, Mapping Christian Education. And then I would like to, to build my own uh, theoretical framework by saying that inclusive CRE needs uh, the CRE itself, and then inclusive education, and then theology of disability. So it is uh, interdisciplinary, but later uh, let's see uh, how it it can be and can be improved uh, more complicated rather than this very uh, simple uh, picture. So I would like to explain one by one. Disability theology is a way of doing theology from a disability point of view, departs from the realization that disability is not a deficiency or imperfection or abnormality. Disability is, is a variation of God's perfect creation. Disability shows that each creation is unique, different from one another, but equal. Disability theology fights for equal rights and dignity for all people. It rewrites traditional church teachings and dogmas, which using the standards of ableism, normalcy, and perfection, and develops teachings and dogmas with disability perspectives. And then inclusive education. I already read uh, the definition. I will just skip that. And then about the Christian education, I use the definition from Jack Seymour, a conversation for living, a seeking to use the resources of the faith and cultural traditions to move into an open future of justice and hope. 
and there are three approaches that must be carried out simultaneously faith community religious instruction and missional approaches that is uh, set by Seymour in his newer book the teaching the way of Jesus and now I would like to present the result of my research in some schools in Indonesia, uh, I mean in Yogyakarta City, a practice of inclusive Christian education uh, in those schools. The objectives of the research get an overview of the implementation of Christian religious education in inclusive schools. Know whether inclusive Christian education can increase the involvement and participation of students with disabilities in school life, family, community, and religious communities. Find out whether in the implementation of CRE in inclusive schools, there is a dialogue between disability theology, inclusive education, and Christian education. So I did that in sekolah tumbuh. Sekolah means school and tumbuh means grow. So it is a grow, uh, grow school, something like that, the meaning of the, the name of the school. And I went to three inclusive elementary schools of Sekolah Tumbuh. And then I also went to a Christian high school. They didn't call themselves as a, an inclusive school, but they always, almost always have at least one student with disability. And I found there, uh, there was a deaf student joined uh, the regular classes. The finding of the research about the implementation of CRE and inclusive schools. CRE and inclusive schools involved students with and without disabilities which needed modification in the educational process, including methodologies, goals, and assessments. And then how uh, inclusive CRE also uh, support the involvement of the students. Sorry. And the participation of the students with disability in school family, religious communities, and society. I found the teacher constantly tried to convince, to convince the student, I mean, to behave good and to speak good words, which was in line with people's expectation in order to be able to participate in the daily life of society. So it was uh, one of the, the efforts that uh, the teacher did. And then also teachers in inclusive schools help students to find and improve their own talents or abilities in order to be economically independent in their future lives. And then about uh, the third one, the dialogue between disability theology, inclusive education and Christian education I found teachers had been prepared with CRE in their formal education and then with inclusive education in their informal training. But what lacking was theology of disability, which they did not learn during their formal and informal trainings. CRE teachers realized the need to learn theology of disability because CRE and inclusive education were not enough in developing inclusive CRE. For example, in inclusive schools of Sekolah Tumbuh, there was no one asked about miracle and healing that Jesus did. The teachers said that some reasons for not asking were uh, disabilities were not diseases that needed to be cured. And then second one, not all persons with disabilities were cured. And then the third one, the experience to be together in inclusive schools led them to accept their friends 
with disabilities as they were. So it was okay, it was good, it was fine, but uh, it was lacking of the theology of disability part. Whereas in general school of SMA BUSA, there were some students who asked their teacher about miracle from God to heal the sick. If miracle was still happening today, why a friend with disabilities was not cured? This question was asked personally outside the classroom. And the teacher could not really answer. They tend to say that disability is weakness and then add with uh, saying that everyone has his or her strengths and weakness. From theology of disability perspectives, disability is not weakness. It is a variation of creations. So there is something lacking here about the theology of disabilities. And then uh, I, I improve uh, more, I develop more about the inclusive Christian religious education using three approaches that must be carried out simultaneously, faith community, religious education, uh, religious instruction and mission or missional uh, approaches. Faith community approach is formation of an inclusive community consisting of persons with and without disabilities where everyone is accepted as he or she is, can grow as a whole person. Instructional approach, opportunity for individuals to read the Bible and learn Christian teachings and dogmas from disability perspectives. Missional approach serves others, brings good news to the world, especially in the context of disability issues promotes the acceptance of persons with disabilities in families, communities, and societies, actively involved in the struggle for equal rights of persons with disabilities in education, health access, public facilities, employment, and in daily living. So I uh, develop more in this chart, uh, the objectives, and then the students, the teachers, the educational process and the context. So the objective students uh, form an inclusive faith community, both, both persons with disabilities and not, and grow in it. Students learn about disability theology so that they have inclusive understanding and attitude. Students play an active role in society to fight for the equal right of persons with disabilities. Students are all people, both persons with disabilities and those without disabilities. The teachers, those who have inclusive perspectives in education and theology. The process through direct experience in forming an inclusive faith community, together learning disability theology and carrying out transformation, transformative actions in the community and the context is inclusive education takes place in school, church, family, and community. And then uh, for theology of disability, which was lacking in, in Indonesia, persons with disabilities are not objects of study or charity, but have a place, role, and function in the church as the body of Christ in accordance with their gifts talents and services. So I use this from uh, Brett Webb Mitchell's book, Beyond Accessibility. The word inclusion has its roots in the Latin word, which can be translated to be shut in or enclosed. Persons with disabilities have the same right to be included, locked up and closed out in the faith community, along with persons without disabilities. And then uh, from this book, I also learn how uh, theology of disability is developed through uh, two steps. The first one, provide access for persons with disabilities 
And then the second one, the full participation of persons with disabilities in communities. So from this study, it is clear that CRE is really an interdisciplinary subject. That's why uh, finally I could uh, throw a more complicated uh, picture rather than the theoretical framework in the beginning before I did the research. So now inclusive CRE consists of several parts, but not only three, theology of disability, inclusive education and CRE, but also it includes uh, psychology, neuroscience, and then learning media, information technology, and uh, education for special needs. So there are several, several subjects that can be used together with a CRE, inclusive education and theology of disability to develop an inclusive CRE. It is not easy, it is not that simple, but it is something challenging. And I think uh, we, can, we can develop with different pictures, depends on the disabilities that, that the students have. And then as the conclusion, inclusive CRE had been naturally implemented in some inclusive schools in Yogyakarta, Indonesia through learning by doing process. Inclusive CRE can increase the involvement and participation of students with disabilities in school life, family, community, and religious communities through the development of their self-confidence. But there, are, there is still a need to intentionally develop inclusive CRE, the dialogue, general CRE, theology of disability, and inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And with plenty of time to spare as well. So we're gonna have good time for conversation later on. Thank you so much. Um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Chandra? Okay. Thank you for the time. And uh, my name is Ravi Chandra. Uh, the primary researcher in this article is Julia, but today she asked me to represent her here due to some uh, difficulties she has with her eyes. Okay, this is imagining the religious education in Indonesia beyond 2045. Let me begin. The background is uh, Indonesian 2045 is a cat word related to the vision about the future of the nation. The dream of 275.25 million Indonesians who live in around 6,000 islands, the multi-religious and multicultural nation will become a sovereign just developed and wealthy one. Yet, there's a very limited discussion of the place of religion and religious education in the roadmap for the visions. In general, the multi-religious Indonesian society lives harmoniously. Yet in the last three decades, there were some conflicts as the Poso conflicts in December 1998 until 2001 for about three years with 500 people as a victims or Moluku or Molokan Islands war in 1999, the bomb terror in Bali, in Sarina, Jakarta, mass demonstration against Basuki, the governor of Jakarta on December 2017. The narrative that exists is Christian versus Islam conflicts increase and it's more. Now, in Indonesia, religious education, as has been said before, is a compulsory subject. It means the education system is intended to guide the adherence of each of the six religions, meaning Islam, Christian, Catholic, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Konghucu, and later in 2017, the indigenous religion, to learn about their own beliefs or spirituality from their primary schools until they complete their higher education. Now, uh, the study is uh, a preliminary survey that explores the thought of people who serve as leaders 
in religious education fields concerning their education, educational paradigm, and awareness of the future challenges in the nation. Thus, the study explores whether for them, the education paradigm should include the need and the right of each student to know not only about his or her own religion, but also the basic teaching of other religions, something that might need a new learning approach. Now, the method is uh, directly the survey participant characteristic and recruitment is participants were recruited from the researchers' acquaintances who have been working in religious education for years or even decades. And 16 people, four are females, participated in this study. Nine are Christian, four are Muslims, while Catholic, Hindu, and indigenous believers are each represented by one person. The age of participant varies from 28 to 64 years old, with the mean age being 48.53. All but four have theological background and nine have doctoral degree or being a doctoral student. Now the data collection uh, techniques here and analysis. The data were collected through an open-ended questionnaire and personal interviews afterward. There are several research questions as the focus. Number one is, will religious education be needed in the year 2045 and beyond, and why do you think so? Number two, to whom, where, and when, and by whom the religious education will be given? What challenges will be faced by religious education then? And what is the overall objective of religious education? And what is the curriculum content? What is the pedagogical approach for such religious educations? Now that the data analysis Data were analyzed qualitatively, looking for similarities and differences among different participants. Now, as the result, whether religious education will still be needed in the year 2045 and beyond, and for what reason, all participants agree that religious education will still be needed in the year 2045 and beyond. The reason that they uh, mentioned is, every child needs guidance through religious education so that she or he will know how to live accordingly. Number two, to whom religious education will be given? This is interesting. 14 participants agree that every child needs religious education since he or she starts schools in grade 12. Six also even agree that every child needs religious education since they were born. Only one wants to provide education until children finish elementary school and other, another one until finish junior high school or equal to grade nine. Four suggests that tertiary student level student also be equipped with religious education. When and where this kind of religious education should take place? All but three agree that religious education should take place first in each home and taught by parents to the children to Christian trees of parents exclusively as religious educators for their own children. For them, religious education is only delivered at home, not at school. But others said the school should also deliver religious education. Three participants, two are Muslim and one is Hindu believer, said that religious education should take place in a special place devoted to religious teaching in addition to schools. And the third result, the overall objective for religious education, according to them, most participants state the future needs inclusive religious education in which students learn to appreciate differences and can see humanity above religion. In short, to prepare the younger generation to become good citizens, not only in Indonesia, but in the whole world. The challenge of religious education by the year 2045 and beyond, most participants mentioned that there will be a need to address and introduce the issue of radicalism, gender equality, and LGBT, and conflict among nations, including nuclear threats and ecology. Result four, the pedagogical approach for such religious education. All agree that doctrinal teaching of one perspective religion will not be sufficient. All participants agree that the approach should be should not be doctrinal, but student-centered and life-centered. Students are equipped to interact peacefully with others, regardless of the differences they might have. According to one's own religious teaching, should be knowing one's own religious teaching would be useless if it does not help them to realize 
that the world is full of differences and that the differences should be celebrated, not eradicated. Tolerance is possible if humanity is above religious fanatic understanding that put the believers of one faith in isolation from believers of other faith. This is an example as the result number five. A team of one Muslim and one Christian religious lecturer use quite a unique approach for the freshman student of various faiths. They ask each student to present their perspective religious understanding regarding a certain issue and learn about the similarities and differences among their view. The student also learn about prejudice, bias, stereotyping, and other matters that make people maintain their own opinion regardless of the differences they face in daily life. Furthermore, the students also learn that religious understanding might need to be modified even when enough scientific discoveries provide evidence that religious teaching is not accurate. For example, the earth is circling the sun instead of the other way around. Also, the concept of God should not be contradicted with scientific understanding. Sub six, who will conduct such religious education? All but two from Islamic background agrees that parents should teach religious to their children. To do so, parents should have rich life experiences and have enough understanding of this religion. The two uh, participants from the Islamic background mentioned that there are some difficulties because some parents might not have uh, sufficient understanding of their own religion. Now, on the other hand, teachers from religious education should have credentials at least equal to undergrad academic background. Teachers will play a prominent role since they have to be flexible, fluent, and open-minded to see that humanity is much more important than strict religious doctrines. Besides this, some also added more requirements like having a close relationship with God at personal level or pluralistic meaning that she or he can act inclusively as Indonesia's nation, various ethnic groups and various religions or in his belief. Now the discussion, based on those results, there are two discussions at least and several items inside that. In general, the participant view that education is still needed. So uh, Indonesia still well, still values uh, religions for the future. The religious education approach should be flexible, relational, and less dogmatic. That's the finding. The learning process of one education should include other religious views and can be attended by anyone, although they do not come from a similar faith background. The objective of religious education is the emphasis of education on values of humanity, unity, and social justice should become the objective of the education process. The student of education process should learn to recognize, to recognize biases, negative stereotypes, and prejudice. They should also understand, accept, and even appreciate the differences in various religious views, including the view of the divine. The place of education in, is mostly school-centered and religious community-based. The role of parents is significant in providing open-minded atmosphere. Yeah. Now, concerning the extremists or radicals, it's interesting. The two researchers, Shafruddin and Ropi, studied that Indonesian youth experience religious identity confusion. Many of the youth really experience that. Their, their study uh, participants were around 6,000 final year mus uh, Muslim undergraduate students who expressed their intolerant attitude toward people of similar faith, but of different sex. Social media and voices of popular radio speaker contribute to this religious identity confusion. That's their finding. This religious leader also direct any dissatisfaction to the Indonesian governments, regardless of any issue they face, even though they did not mention that they wanted to overrule the Indonesian government or replace it with their own uh, religious uh, government. Yeah. That is the finding and discussion so far. A uh, little bit addition for me is perhaps some people might uh, feel reluctant to go that far if they, in the future, worries or concern about syncretism, relativism, or other things. But the other side, we can see that with such uh, inclusive and also a student-centered and life-centered education, actually, each person can deepen their understanding of the core of their faith and still can appreciate other faith uh, accordingly.
I think I have to stop here, except if Julia would like to add one or two words. If not, thank you for the opportunity. Julia, oh, well, thank you, Robbie, for just um, flying through that with such clarity, but with ample time for us to, to have a conversation as well. Thank you. Um, and we recognize that, that Julia is the principal researcher for this paper um, in collaboration with Robbie. Um, all right. Now, let us, um, if, if I may, um, since we're a small group here together, um, to kind of uh, experience a little bit or at least embody a little bit of what uh, Dr. Christianity, Christiani, sorry, um, uh, is encouraging us to think about in terms of disability theology, disability studies, and religious education. Let's take a, a brief pause. Um, to assemble our thoughts and to process it in ways um, that will allow us to get into the conversation together. Right? So with that, I invite us to have maybe two minutes of silence after I stop talking here and explaining, two or three minutes of silence. I will throw uh, into the chat box a link to a doodle page um, on a Miro dashboard. If you're familiar with that, just go there and look, poke around and, and offer some notes there. If it's too confusing for you, if it takes over your Zoom screen, don't worry about it. Use the chat box in Zoom, right? Just to capture some words, some ideas as a way to prime the pump quietly before we open up the mic and the floor for conversation, okay? So here is the link to the, uh, what I'm calling the doodle page on uh, uh, the Miro dashboard that I've just created for us here. You should be able to get them there as a guest user, right? Okay, I see some visitors already uh, popping up. And if not, again, don't be flustered if it's confusing. Um, we'll just give ourselves time and use the, the Zoom chat box, okay? I'll be quiet now for us to explore and think. All right, we've given ourselves a good three minutes for this. So thank you, everybody. Um, let me invite us into the conversation together here. You have two ways. One is to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you so that you can speak your question or comment um, into this room and or drop your question or comment into the Zoom chat box. I'll also monitor the mural board if you're doodling there, okay? So let me um, invite, uh, just for the sake of getting us started, let me invite um, Tamar here, who I think dropped the first question in our Zoom chat box, to speak to that if you would like. Just a background question. Uh, who plans the curriculums in Indonesia? Is it the um, Ministry of Education that plans or designs it and approves it, or the faith communities themselves have to plan it? Who is it for, the question, or just anybody? It's Indonesian context, so whichever presenter likes to answer. May I answer the question, Tamar? Yeah, the, 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 the curriculum, the Christian education, including uh, all the religious education curriculum, uh, is organized by the Ministry of Education together with the Ministry of Religion. Yeah, so they put together all scholars and uh, prominent figures to get involved in planning the curriculum. And it's part of the standardized curriculum of all of the public schools in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. Does that help, Dr. Masala? Okay, all right. So we have another one. It's all organized. So it's all organized. All organized, okay. Um, so uh, let me see if we have anybody who wants to name a question before I go to the next question on the chat box. Does anybody want to raise their hand, their digital hand and offer a question? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to invite the, our next um, participant um, to, uh, to speak to the question in the chat box if you'd like. The question is how to present God as real for students with disabilities. I'm assuming it's for 
um, Tabitha, but uh, <laughs> does anybody want to speak to that, the person who dropped that question? Okay. It's me uh, who raised this question. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I, it's, um, real, it's real problematic, I think. Yeah. Mm. I think how with their limited abilities compared to other normal students, quote unquote, they feel that uh, God is uh, doing injustice. Mm. Go ahead, Tabitha. Okay. <laughs> So I think if it is very early in the in the age of the children that we introduce God, usually there is no problem with that. If it is too late and then the, the students are already uh, able to think like very high uh, levels, so it's more difficult. And I found, I met with uh, many children with disabilities, for example, with, uh, with Down syndrome, they didn't have any problem with God. Even they could explain who God for them. And sometimes they give a kind of uh, something to, to say <laughs> who God is for them. And then they can teach others about God. So for them, uh, there is no problem with God. But for other, I mean, for those who are without disabilities, they raise the question, if God loves them, why they are not healed? Something like that. So it's very diverse, I think, uh, for them. And then I found also for, for uh, students with, with uh, autism, for example, if they teach them, they, uh, we, 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 we need to use more pictures because they are more visually. So there is a modification in the process of education, but uh, usually there is no problem with with introducing God for, for the students, especially if they, they uh, receive that very early in their age. I think uh, that is my experience <laughs> or my knowledge, but maybe uh, others can add with uh, different uh, experiences or knowledge. Does anybody want to chime in? Okay. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tabitha, because I heard in another presentation a few years ago that someone uh, did a doctoral study on this topic, spirituality in parents of uh, disability children. And uh, she found that many parents actually have difficulties to accept the reality of their children's disabilities. Like for instance, one parent, uh, one, one, one parent waited until uh, 14 years before they finally give up that their children have this uh, autis autism uh, uh, disability. And before that, during those 14 long years, they always complain to God. They always think or thought that the disability of the child is a curse, is caused by a sin made by their ancestors. Mm. So that's why I think this is a real uh, issue that we have to deal with because more and more children in Indonesia suffer from autism. I don't know why, but, but it's the case, it's the fact. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. So I yes. think we, we really need to deal with this real issue. Yeah, thank you for the good presentation. Okay, thank you, Julia. I think from uh, what you just uh, explained, it's clear that uh, the parents play very important roles yeah. in introducing what uh, God is or who God is. If the parents complaining 
almost all the time about God and saying that God doesn't love them, God doesn't care them. So that is what the, the children uh, accepted God like that. So if the parents could explain that God loves the children with disability and the parents can accept them as they are, as their children, uh, God's gifts. So there will be no problem with introducing God. So it, it depends very much on, on the parents. I agree with that. So uh, what we can do is uh, educate the parents. It should be done before the, the, the marriage. I mean, kind of a education, pre-marriage education in the church to prepare them. If they have children, what will they do? Usually uh, the church only say, if you have children, you have to educate them in, in uh, Christian faith, something like that. But they don't uh, teach how if the children or the child you, you have is a person with disabilities. So I think that is very important to, to educate uh, the parents to be, to really prepare themselves if it happens. So, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for this, this yeah. question. Yeah. It, it yeah. Uh, can develop <laughs> my paper more <laughs> to include uh, parents and parents to be. <laughs> about this yeah that's that's oh. very real because in indonesia uh, the moral approach to disability like uh, that disability is a curse it's still uh, strong in many people in indonesia regardless of the religions they belong to yeah. because i <laughs> i have a muslim a good friend who also experienced the same when she gave birth to a boy with autism. And then the whole family asked her, what did she do when she was pregnant? What sins that she did? So mm -hmm. she gave birth into a, a child, a boy with autism. In Christian, <laughs> in Christian uh, communities, it also happens. So <laughs> it depends very much on, on the parents and other people around or the whole family. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So I'm seeing um, two questions that we have written down, but I also see a digital hand raise here. So I'm going to privilege the hand first, but I'm just noting, noting that we are kind of zero in on the, the role of the one who educates or the, rather than just the recipient of the education or formation here. So uh, I'll try to build on that as a segue. Um, but I'm seeing a hand here. Is it Paulus Cristiano? Would you like to ask your question? Okay, thank you for your opportunity, uh, Professor Mark. May on. Uh, I'm from Indonesia also, same with uh, Dr. Sabita, Dr. Julia, and Dr. Robi Chandra. I'm so glad when uh, Dr. Sabita present uh, to us about to propose inclusive religious education. It is a very important for Indonesia. I'm also a teacher in school. This is the novelty to meet this abilities person and maybe normal person and because in the fact in reality disabilities uh, when a sub into a school it's very uh, difficult but from this presentation from Dr. Sabita can help us to understand that disability not only held in inclusive school, but it can be uh, combined with normal students. So we can learn together and maybe um, building solidarity very good uh, and it's very important to us from, uh, especially from Indonesian perspectives. And my question is when uh, to Dr. Julia, uh, 
presentation about uh, imagining religious education in Indonesia beyond 2045. And when we uh, read the paper, and this is using the term of Pancasila and uh, research and uh, propose a models, something like that. And I add a, a situation from Indonesia, and there are some many problems about freedom of religious and beliefs. And this is a, a big issue in Indonesia, not only Indonesia maybe, but also in Asia, because uh, there are so many beliefs or agama kepercayaan or only kepercayaan in Bahasa always state like that, because beliefs not accept as a part of uh, this constitution, especially or from the regulation of Indonesia and maybe from a part of Pancasila, maybe it can be a central point to be a good context to building the imagination, religious education beyond 2045, I think something like that. Because when, when we the, don't add this context as a part of maybe religious education, uh, our students uh, who say their belief not like a uh, religion is very difficult and cannot learn together and maybe cannot participate in classroom, in society, and maybe in community of faith and so on. I think this is a very important uh, situation as a statement and maybe opinion and maybe a question in it. Thank you. Thank you, Paulus. Dr. Tapita, Dr. Julia, or Dr. Rabi? Uh, Julia just mentioned that I am the one who's supposed to answer the question. Let me respond quickly. Uh, it is true that since 1945, when the Indonesian government uh, got its uh, freedom, its our nation would get the freedom, there are some, uh, there was some discrimination toward the indigenous religions. There are about 125 groups among them, and only in the, uh, 2003, if I'm not mistaken, uh, their existence ex accepted as one of the religions beside the six religions that the government see as a legal one or accepted. And they have a curriculum now, 2017, there are efforts to create a curriculum and the Department of Religious Affairs even include that in their, in, in their uh, system. So there are some, some news there, but it is true what you said, in many schools, in many areas, some of them, uh, were forced to take religious education that uh, that they don't belong to, or they even have to worship uh, as if they are uh, belong uh, they are adhered to a certain religion. Even when they got married, if they could not put uh, themselves either they are Christian, Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, or Confucian or uh, uh, or Muslim, they they have to choose one of them. It's really really sad, even in their ID. But it is now the government's working hard in the last five years to to change that, to replace that. Although in the uh, in some territories, it's still the practice still exists. We just, we, we we can through. But there is also now there's a what is to call it? Uh, they have a unit a union among themselves, and there's so many studies about uh, some of the big reli uh, indigenous religions in this country. It's a good to. It, but really, thank you for your question. What, uh, what to be done about that is uh, among the Christian, for example, uh, I think there should be some awareness raising to recognize uh, their presence, their heritage, and their contribution to this country, even toward the Christian. I believe so. I believe so. There are some things about them that we can learn. Even if we understand the theological discussion in Korea about 10 years ago and so on, there's some recognition theologically about their, uh, why God put them together with us. Yeah, about the Holy Spirit. There are big discussion about that, beginning with the discussion about Holy Spirit in Canberra, 
this 1972, I believe, and continue in Korea and continue in uh, Asiska and continue in Oxford. So there are some recognition around the world about these indigenous religions and their educations. That's what I can say that I can contribute from my, my perspective and my study. Maybe Julia would like to say something. <laughs> yeah. That is true. Because in Indonesia, people, uh, the government define religion as a group who has a prophet, a uh, scripture, a worship system, and organization system. And the indigenous religion do not uh, have their own prophets because they have different kind of prophets or not even prophets, the saints or whatever. And they have different kind of, uh, not, not a big unified scripture, but different kind of teachings. Yeah. They are more communal based, and but their presence and their uh, capability to withstand all the discrimination is very strong. There are so many studies about it. Thank you. So I don't want to cut you off, Julia, if you wanted to say, but I, I think this is a good segue to the question that still remains in the chat uh, box. But did you want to say anything to uh, on this, Julia? You said about the. Uh, I don't think uh, I can hear you very well on audio. Christian and Catholic as separate religion is that the question? Um, no, the question right above it by Andrew. Um, we um, I wanted to go back to that because I think. Oh yeah 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 I forgot I forgot. <laughs> okay. The question uh, is that yeah. yeah the the whether it is uh, curriculum let me let me check again. Uh, Robby, can you read the question? Let me read off the question, and then I'll invite Andrew to speak to it if he will, if he's able to. Uh, the question, yeah. Andrew, is: Is there a conversation happening about the difference between education about religions and education in a religion? And uh, can you hear me? So, uh, first off, this is a little unprofessional, but I'm listening as I'm running. And I'm on mile three, so I'm a little out of breath. Um, but my, my question stems from um, having spent a couple months in Indonesia in 2019 and realizing that really the survival of the country depends on um, religious tolerance and pluralism with so many different um, religious groups interacting. And so I'm wondering, as I listen to Robbie's presentation, and listen to those responses by the people he surveyed, is there an understanding, um, maybe broadly um, at a governmental level or at a popular level of that difference between educating one in one's own beliefs and educating one in the diversity of religious systems for the purpose of of tolerance in a pluralistic society, uh, but also uh, communal and civic understanding. Yes, thank you for your uh, question, Andrew. Um, actually, we drive uh, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of uh, Religion, religious affairs, drive uh, a, a new approach. They call it. Uh, Moderasi Beragama Religious Moderation, and they they uh, first they ask the curriculum planner, planners and the curriculum writers to uh, write the curriculum, but not not. Uh, insulting the other religion. Usually they, they, they used to do that uh, previously, but they make sure that this time it won't be happening again. So they only talk about the, their own uh, doctrines, of course, about their uh, own belief, but they also uh, make a comparison if there is some similar issues in the other religion but not in the negative uh, tone. But we hope from our study, we hope that 
it is only the starting point. The next point would be uh, writing the curriculum, also including the understanding the doctrines of other faith so that all students regardless of their religion can learn about other religion other faith so they would be able to respect any other people from diverse faith so that's what we hope maybe we maybe i do not explain it really well but that's that's our objective by doing this study maybe uh robbie can you add more I think it is sufficient, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tabitha, did you want to speak to that? Yes, I want to add <laughs> because I did some research on that as well. So I think uh, the teachers now in Indonesia are very creative. How to modify the mono religious education to become more inter religious education? So some uh, groups do that by developing what is so-called uh, interreligious education as supplement of the uh, religious education in the schools. And some other, like in Catholic or Protestant uh, schools, they do that by uh, developing an open Christian education. So even, even though it is called Christian education, but they do it by uh, appreciating other faiths or other religions as well. So if the teachers ask the students, uh, the Christian students to go to the church to do several tasks, and then for the Muslim students, uh, the teachers will ask them to go to the mosque and ask uh, the ustads about certain uh, tasks that they, they have to do. So they are not forced to go to the church because they are Muslims. Because in, in Christian uh, schools in Indonesia, they offer only Christian education for all students, regardless of the uh, religious background of the students. So it depends on the schools, whether they think that uh, mission means <laughs> to to uh, to make others to become Christians or to be tolerant with with uh, the students who are not Christians. So related to the question whether it is uh, education in a religion or education about religions, it it. Uh, in Indonesia, we also discuss about that. We call it pendidikan agama. It is education in a religion. And then pendidikan keagamaan, education about religion. So usually in the Christian schools, they would say to non-Christian students, accept this as a knowledge. So it is education about religion about Christianity. So you will understand Christianity is like this or like that. But you don't have to be Christian or to, you you are not forced to be Christians, something uh, like that that the, the teachers say. But uh, for the Christian students, it is education in a religion. So they, they want to, uh, the Christian students to be better better uh, better christians uh, that is that what i can add a little bit this is, it's a great question andrew um in a, a question that the rea has addressed in in a number of ways over the years right dedicating several conferences to it as well i'd like to take us to um, a question that is posted on miro and it might be our last question for the evening um and let me share screen here and the question is to both presentations um, and it's here at the bottom in this yellow sticky note here. Can you see it? Um, sorry, I'll read it out loud for those who can't see. For both presentations, how have you observed how mutuality in Christian religious education is cultivated so that learning doesn't always privilege the positionality of the professional educator? All right. So 
great, uh, we're gonna call it full question there. I'm gonna stop sharing screen so that anyone of you three, sorry. And I'll also cut and paste the question into the chat box. My aunt, could you please uh, show it again? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because I've, it's difficult to read. <laughs> I've, I've dropped it in the chat box for us as well. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yep. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will read. Right there. And um, for those of you who just joined us, there's a kind of a doodling space that we created on the side. And yeah, yeah, there's right. a link, yeah, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. What does it mean with the mutuality, the term that you see in the questions? What does this mean? Uh, mutuality. Um, yeah, what does it mean? Do you have- In what is sense? The person, is, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Robbie. Is the person who wrote the question still on the call with us to speak to the question? Uh, I don't think so. I think we've, we've lost a couple of participants. Um, if I may take the liberty to interpret here, um, mutuality in Christian religious education, I think a, a principle, a value in which um, okay. teacher learner, right, engage mutually with one another, right? There's a reciprocity back and forth. So it's not just, you know, right. teacher part knowledge upon learner, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that that's what's invoked there. And so how is mutuality um, a part of this? Uh, as you think about it, inclusivity, right, for disability and religious education and inter-religious education, right, Julia's right, right, education right. there, um, that doesn't privilege just the professional educator and, and, and their uh, positionality. I, I, might, I, I might try to answer that one. I think a Christian education can, uh, especially Christian education or religious education, as has been found in the Julia's research, is not sufficient to be done only by professional teachers, especially in Indonesian context where quote unquote feudalism and hierarchy and tribal religions and tribal tradition are very strong with people classified based on age or your normalcy quote unquote or whatever. But it is, uh, uh, it is also should be done by parents and no, even the media the media is uh, teaching the children, also the parents, the church, or the religious institutions, and then also. Now the problem is uh, whatever curriculum, whatever is not only the content but the process. And when we talk about the process, we have to learn, and then we need to observe that there are so many practices uh, on the based on the foundation, realized or not realized, people are aware or not, based on the top-down system. I'm the professional, I'm the, I'm the center, I'm the, I'm the uh, subject of uh, the, the content, content transfer and you are just only the objects. Now, this is a thing I think the number one issue to be changed before we go into a more meaningful educational process at home as well in the school as or other places. I think so when we talk about maturity. Tabitha or Julia? Julia, would you please go first? No, Julia. <laughs> so, okay. Julia. Uh, I think for the, the uh, religious education in Indonesia, uh, it is not the privilege of professional educator uh themselves but also from from the religious uh, groups i mean uh in some some public schools for example who have only a few christian uh, students they don't have christian uh, religious education teacher and they would uh ask the student to go to the church and get the Christian education there. And also the assessment and the mark <laughs> at the end of the semester come, comes from the church. Sometimes it happens. 
otherwise any uh, Christian teachers in that school, whether it is sport teacher or math teacher, because they are Christian, they are asked to teach Christian education. So they will think, no, 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 I didn't have that training before. But yeah, sometimes it happens. But if uh, it is related to 2045, and we would say, is will there be a, a religious education at that time? Most people would say yes, because it is a part of the professional uh, professional job. <laughs> so if there is no more religious education in 2045. So I think many people will not be happy because <laughs> the, the teachers, professional teachers would say, what, what can I do after 2045 if there is no more uh, religious education? So it is mostly by the professional educators. Yeah. Hmm. Where um, our chat box is, is, is uh, getting hot again with uh, comments and sharing and questions. I'm also mindful for time because it might be late for some parts uh, of the world uh, for our participants in this call. Um, but if there's time for us to just kind of add one more question, right? Um, and I, I think um, I want to acknowledge the, the, uh, um, what Elizabeth just shared in the chat box, the work that she had done uh, back in the 80s. Um, but Peter, you have a question that I think we had tried to address at some point before, um, but uh, we could go back to, to that a little bit now. Peter's question is, how do you respond in your teaching or ministry to those who express exclusionary theology toward disabled persons or persons with disabilities? Let me see the question. Can you say it again? <laughs> because I could not find the question. There we go. Um, the question is, how do you respond in your teaching or ministry to those who express exclusionary theology to those who are disabled? Yeah. <laughs> I will challenge them uh, to, to, to look at the more inclusive uh, theology. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, a big challenge because Many people are still in the in the moral approach to disability, rather than uh, others uh, other other approaches. So it is still very strong in Indonesia as well. I think maybe it's not that strong anymore in the western uh, western parts, <laughs> western uh, communities. I don't know, but in Indonesia and in Asian. Uh, communities, it's still strong. Peter, did you want to get to the conversation at all? I wasn't sure whether you could get <laughs> you could join yes. us. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've had my my um, camera off this this whole time. My wife just got back home, and uh, we switched places with uh, with caring for for the baby. Um, thank you for that that uh, that response, uh, Dr. Cristiani. Uh, and part of the reason that I ask is. Um, I'm thinking about the folks that uh, that my dad, who's a minister in, in the Philippines, um, like the kinds of things that he does with folks who have uh, very little formal education, let alone theological education, at least for, uh, at least in the ways that we think about it in the West. Um, and and how how to challenge that that theology without simply saying, well, that's wrong. This is the way you should think about it. In my experience uh, and observation that hasn't worked the way I just put it that bluntly does has not worked too well. I think one way is using the biblical passages to interpret from the perspective of uh, theology of disability. So uh, I think uh, hermeneutics with uh, disability perspectives is developed now. So we can use that in our sermons, in our Bible studies to open up uh, people's uh, perspectives to include the disability perspectives on uh, the hermeneutics of the Bible. 
Thank you so much. I see that our tech person is here. Uh, Dr. Lee, did you want to? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, going against the rule as a tech person that I need to turn off my camera and microphone, but uh, I just cannot do that any longer because conversation is so interesting. Um, you know, to, to Peter's question, hi, Peter. Um, uh, Dr. Marik, Mariska Laura Brown invited me to speak at her school's uh, anniversary event uh, in, in February, and uh, Tabitha was there, and my talk was about the trauma-informed approach and pedagogy. So uh, uh, I framed the entire thing, you know, by defining what trauma means, and it's not just a sexual uh, trauma, but religious trauma. And then very active conversations in the chat room at the time, I think we had about over uh, almost 600 people uh, in that uh, talk. Um, the someone put question in Pahasa about his experience of being, you know, it's exactly what Tabitha just said about being bullied and uh, being told that he is the result of God's punishment and how do we address this uh, at a church context because that's where he experienced uh, at a Christian church. And so I think uh, uh, defining uh, what trauma means and how, how critical it is, I think gave him a language to reframe his response uh, that the, uh, the trauma-informed pedagogy needs to be put in context of a trauma-informed uh, approach that what in that particular context, you know, why people think the way they think. And so I think that looking at that through trauma lens, uh, uh, also um, religious trauma in Indonesian context as a minority Christian and also um, the, within the community and also colonialism, that is uh, added the uh, layers of uh, uh, the colonial legacy uh, in addition to being a religious minority. That uh, lends, uh, to understanding that uh, as a, you know, causing trauma, I think gave that person the language that there is a lot of exciting uh, responses in the chat room going on. So I saw some possibilities there. Thank you. Also at the risk, oh no, Dr. Julia, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just thank you, uh, Boyang, because uh, I think you have a really good comment. We can't hear you very well, is that right? Yeah, and I, I want to thank uh, Boyang for the suggestion, for the comment. Thank you, Julia. If I may add one more thing, I think because we tend to blame disability as a uh, as an individual cause and how we understand the disability if uh, based on individualistic salvation uh, atonement theology. But if we put it in a, a structural context uh, that also colonialism, religious uh, trauma, I, I think that we can maybe frame in different ways. I'm, I'm mindful that at the risk of also overstepping my role as timekeeper of this session, <laughs> you got to try to wrap this up. You know, pretty whoa. Uh, hold on, I see another question because I want to kind of make the transition so that our tech um, uh, expert can uh, 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 direct us to the evaluation for this session in the last five minutes of our time together. But I think Dr. Tamar just uh, added a question that's important, at least to be named here. Uh, Tamar, do you want to speak to that? Hey, um, with the rise of the religious extremism in all religions, would this if you would how would that project on your your findings? How would that might affect your findings, your research? This is to Dr. Suleiman and Chandra. Robbie, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, I just asked Julia to, to answer that one. Well, uh, there is a possibility because uh, there's, this is a preliminary survey. So I think we have to continue surveying more than 100 or 200 uh, teachers or religious leaders yeah, for the, the, the issues and get some ideas uh, more about that. But uh, 
if the question is whether the rise of uh, extremism or radicalism affect the finding of this one, it might, as the uh, participants are well known, so to speak, people, they might, uh, they might, uh, the question might, uh, uh, might, uh, might drive them to, to give a more, uh, I agree, more open-minded uh, position to the open-minded position. Although in every day they might not be like that, I don't know. But uh, out of the thirteen, I know only four or five of them. Julia, can you uh, continue that one? The question is whether uh, the, the the religious extremism, the rise of religious extremism, uh, influence your findings. Is it possible? Uh, it is very, very possible, Tamar, uh, because as a religious minorities uh, of persons, everything that we do, everything that we present actually uh, might raise questions from, from the other people, uh, mostly from the majority. So that's why you have to be careful how to put these findings in the natural framework uh, so that people will think in the long run that Indonesia will still be Indonesia if we keep all the religious, all religions, uh, not only uh, favoring one major religion. So this is a very uh, crucial issue, I think. Is our concern. Yeah, but, but thank you very much, Tamar, uh, for your uh, comment, for your uh, question. All right. Thank you. Tabata, did you want to have a, a kind of final word before we wrap up our session here? Uh, please admit yourself. <laughs> I want to go back to my own presentation. So I dream that in 2045, all schools in Indonesia will be inclusive schools. There is no more uh, special schools and all uh, religious education, I mean all re religions in all religions will be inclusive religious education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let us join together in um, expressing appreciation to our three presenters and for their work and for the lineages that they bring to <laughs> REA.